Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for each and every day. We thank you, Lord, for the breath of life itself. Father, I ask you to use Miss Terry and myself as your tool, as your vessel, to bring forth the word of God, the true word of God, which we shall hear today. Let it resonate in our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits so that we may come to the best understanding of the love that you have us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. You guys go ahead and head back with Miss Terry. <coughs> Well, good morning to everybody who is here and uh, new folks, some new folks. Uh, uh, we're going to call you new friends, okay? I'm not going to call you a visitor because I hope you're going to be back tomorrow. Um, not tomorrow. Next, next. Uh, <laughs> hey, tomorrow will be fine. We'll be here tomorrow. Uh, well, we won't be here tomorrow, but the men's church will be here tomorrow. And then, uh, of course, Tuesday night we have Trail Life and American Heritage Girl. Wednesday night we have Bible study. Thursday night's my night off, so, uh, but actually I'm going to have several here for a little while. Yeah, I'm going to have a few, man, that's good. I mean, it's, it's time. I wish it was at a beach somewhere, like in Hawaii maybe, but, you know, I have my little marker here, Hawaiian marker, so it can, it can let me dream, right? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Oh, I'll miss everybody. I really will. All right, well, let's get on with our teaching today. Uh, chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Oh, uh, this morning, when I got with the Lord about 5 o'clock this morning and, and prayed it up and talked to him, and, and I told him, I said, Lord, this is a topic that we're going to talk about today that I have wondered on for a long time. I was very curious as to what all it involved, what it entailed, uh, how it actually works, and on and on and on and on and on. And I pray, Lord, that you will just open up my eyes to see your word as you have written it. And that's exactly what he did. I, I hope and pray that the blessing I received this morning, you will receive that same blessing today and uh, come to the better understanding of this particular scripture that we're going to talk about today. It is a very... Uh, debated i'm going to just put it that way a very debated scripture and uh, a lot of people wonder you know well is it real is it not real on and on and on and on we're going to go through all that today uh just to let you know i wrote a book this morning okay so we're going to be here for you know at least i don't know five or six hours maybe no we, it won't take that long i don't think but uh but I, it's it's very important that we understand what Paul is talking about here in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. First, I want to give you just a little short background of why Corinthians was written and uh, First and Second Corinthians was written. First and foremost is Paul started the church of Corinth. He started the church of Corinth. And the doctrine he taught is the doctrine that God gave him. You can read that over in Galatians chapter 1 verse 1. What he received was not by man, but by God himself. And so therefore, what he taught was the true word of God to the church of Corinth. And then he moved on, and he went over. He happened to be in Ephesus at this particular time. And um, the, uh, the Jews started coming in, and other people started coming into the church and trying to, and disrupting his teaching, disrupting his church, disrupting his theology, and trying to change things and make it suit themselves, which we have a lot of that today. People want to take the Word of God and change it to suit themselves instead of changing themselves to suit God's Word. Okay? And this is where we've got to understand that we are wrong in trying to suit God's word to suit us or change God's word to suit us we need to change to suit God's word because his word is true agreed amen amen so God blessed me this morning with this teaching and I was so thankful for it because as I've explained to many people uh, many many different times I did not have a clear understanding of what it was all about and I've heard many things from many different people going many different directions. And, I, and you try to absorb all this stuff, and, and it just it doesn't come together. And so when I prayed to the Lord this morning, I said, Lord, I want it to come together. I want to understand not what people have told me, not what people say, not what people think. I want to know what you say. 
I want to know your words. Okay? And that is my whole ministry, is to understand God's word to the point to where it is from God, not from me, not from you, not from anybody else, not somebody's opinion, but from God himself. And I have been been, um, teaching for several weeks now on the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power lives inside of you and me and is available to you and me if we seek it out. We have to seek it out. And I feel as though that we have covered this to a great degree, but not to an over and abundance of something that was just babbling on or just rocking on. It was very informative to you, and I pray it was. You can go back and see past teachings if you want to, to try to catch up on all this. Uh, But today, I'm going to finish the series on the Holy Spirit. I mean, God just works it out like he works it out. I thought I was going to finish it a couple of weeks ago. And now that I'm going to be out, God has brought it to a perfect ending. And and in my opinion, I'm going to say, and I'm not asking you to, to, to accept my opinion. I'm asking you to make your own opinion once you hear the true word of God here. It is amazing how God has brought me to this point that I wanted to get a couple of weeks ago because this is the end. Not the end of me, of course, but, but, but it is the end, and it's a, it's a perfect ending at the time that I'm going to have to take a break for a short while. Okay? So let's enjoy and keep an open mind to God's true and holy word, which is in chapter 14. Now, we're going to look at a little bit in chapter 12. We're going to look at a little bit in chapter 13, which we've already covered. I'm going to refer over to 2 Timothy. I'm going to refer over to um, Ephesians, but we don't need to go there, okay? I'm just going to tell you where it's at. You can make a mark on your Bible or your notes or whatever you do, and then refer to that later on, because I'm going to tell you what it says in that scripture, and then you can go and proof it up later. But the scriptures that I want you to go to is going to be in chapter 12, 13, and 14, primarily chapter 14. And yes, we're going to go chapter by, or we're going to go line by line in chapter 14. Oh, well, that's a long chapter. Well, you got till tomorrow, right? I don't have to be at the doctor till 10 in the morning, so we're good, right? It won't take that long, I guarantee you. <clears throat> I'm going to start just like I started off this morning. I praise you, God. I praise you, God, for the message that you have given me, for this message you have given me today. Because it concludes the series. It concludes the series that you started in my heart a a little while back, or quite a while back, actually. And I thank you for the blessing. It has truly, truly blessed my heart and my knowledge and my wisdom and my spirit to understand the word of truth. And I pray, Lord that those who hear it today will also receive your words of truth. As I uh, shared with you in the weeks past, when you come to Christ, when you come to Christ and submit yourself to Christ, you will receive the promised Holy Spirit. Now, we looked through the Scriptures, and we saw that where Jesus said over in the Gospels, he says, go to, to Jerusalem and wait there until you are blessed with the Holy Spirit. That led us into the day of Pentecost over in Acts 2, right? All right, Jesus told them to do that. And so many people think that you don't receive the Holy Spirit when, when you receive Christ. But we, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm getting ahead of my notes, But we saw in the book of Acts that that is not so. And I'm going to share that with you here in just a second. When you come to Christ and um, submit yourself to Christ, truly, truly submit yourself in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit to Christ, and being a following of, of Christ, immediately upon your submission, you are endued with the Holy Spirit. He comes upon you at that very moment. Okay? Also, you are redeemed by God because of the blood of Jesus. You are justified by God by the blood of Jesus. And you are sanctified by God by the blood of Jesus. Okay? 
In simple terms, God has accepted you only on the basis, only on the basis that your sins are being washed away by the blood-bought sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And you are saved for His good pleasure. Not because you're such a perfect person or a wonderful person or a good person. It is you are saved for His good pleasure. For His pleasure. Oh, well, God saved me because I'm so good. God saved me because I'm cute. And I know that's not true. God saved me because I can just do miracles and, one, and, and, and just do awesome things for him. I have a lot of money. We can just build his church and we can do all kinds of things. I have a lot of strength, a lot of power. We can, we can build that church. One of the things that I hate to hear from people whenever they come, new people who come to our church, and believe me, I haven't heard it from you guys, so we're good. But people come to me often and they say, God sent me here to help you build this church. And I say to them, I said, but I don't build a church. God builds a church. I'm just here to do what he tells me to do. So if you're here to help me build a church, you're here for the wrong reason. And I attest to you, okay, I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but I attest to you. All of those, all of those people who have come and said that last about a month, maybe, maybe two, but a very short time. And then they go help somebody else build their church. And I'm glad. Because in their heart of hearts, it's not to build God's church. It is to build themselves up in God's church. And that's not our purpose, friend. It's not our purpose. It's not our cause. And that's not our calling. Our calling is to come and help God build his church as he directs. As he directs. Well, I've got this great idea that it'll just make your church wonderful. Church is already wonderful. You know? Because God's got it. <clears throat> now, if you've got something that you want to do, you think that can help build God's church with the power of God living in you, just let me know and I'll talk to you about it. I am not going to do it. Because, see, usually those people say, well, this is what you need to do. And I said, I ain't doing it. Because I do what I need to do. I do what he's called me to do. If you want to do a ministry, then you tell me what it is. And if, it's a, if, it's, if I feel as though, because I'm going to pray about it, and if I feel as God is good to go with it, then I'll talk with you on it, and I'll support you 100%. If it's to edify you, you might as well hit the door. Okay? But if it's to build God's church for God, man, I'm all ears. I would love to help you do that, and I would love for you to help us do that. And that is your purpose for being here. <clears throat> as a token of his love for us because of what we have done, which is choose Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, as a token of his love for us, he has imparted to you and to me himself, himself, in the form of the third deity of the triune God, which is the Holy Spirit. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's our triune God that we worship. The Holy Spirit is to live, guide, and direct you through your life and me through my life for His good works. For His good works, not ours. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. You might want to make a note of that so you can look at it later. That's in Ephesians 2. In doing so, his promise is to complete what he has started in us until the day of Christ Jesus, to the day of the coming of the Lord. That's Philippians 1.6. Philippians 1.6. In order to accomplish this, his Holy Spirit has brought to you at least one you have, if you're a true child of God, you have at least one special gift given to you by the Holy Spirit. Now, you might have many gifts, but you have one in particular gift that God wants you to use in order to build his church. 
Mine happens to be up here on the pulpit or teaching the Word of God. That's what he's called me to do. I thought it was swinging a hammer for many, many years. And I thought it was sweeping floors for a while. I thought it was taking out trash and cleaning toilets for a while. I don't have a problem with that. I do all things as unto the Lord. But as the Lord grew me by the power of the Holy Spirit and developed me by the power of the Holy Spirit, he has revealed to me that it is the teaching of the Word. Now, I'm not boasting or bragging or anything like that, but that is what God has called me to do. And therefore, that's what I do. But only you, only you can find out what the, that gift, that special gift God has for you is. I can't tell you what it is. You have to talk with the God. You have to talk with the Holy Spirit. You have to pray about it. And you have to let God direct you as to whatever your gift happens to be. But promise you this. You have a gift. There is something that you can do for the kingdom of God that God is looking for you to take hold of and do. Remember we talked about the spoke. Being part of the body, being part of the body of Christ. We talked about the spoke on the wheel. It takes every spoke on that wheel to make that wheel function as it is supposed to do. With God being the center, Jesus being the rim, which holds us all together, it takes every spoke. If one of those spokes is not doing what God has called them to do, that wheel will not operate in a, in a, uh, a perfect manner as it is designed to do. God designed his church. You didn't know you were a spoke, did you? I didn't say a sport. I said a spoke. But we all are. We are a part of the body. Chapter 12 tells us all about that. <clears throat> this, gift is not, uh, this gift is not for your success. It's not for your advancement. It's not for your profit. It is for the building of his kingdom. Paul tells us his purpose in this life over in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. There's another reference, 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. I'm going to paraphrase it real quickly. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept, I have kept the faith. And the Lord has laid up my crown of righteousness for the day that I stand before him. See, that's why you do what you do. For your rewards that you're going to receive from Christ, your crowns. There's five crowns spoken of in the, in the, in the uh, scriptures. And I want every fi all five crowns. And I truly believe that such as the crown of righteousness... If I do something I'm just going to say is righteous, now we know it's not my righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness in me that works. So if I do something that is righteous, that pleases God, he's going to set me a crown to side, if you will. Well, if I do something again that might be righteous, that is righteous, not might be, that is righteous for God's kingdom, then he's going to set another crown of righteousness for me. And another crown, and another crown, and another crown, and another crown. He's going to provide all of these crowns for me that someday, whenever I get to heaven, he's simply going to say, well done, good and faithful servants. Here's your rewards. And then I can take all those crowns and lay them at the foot of Jesus. I lay those at the foot of Jesus because of what he did for me. Do we understand that? See, we have to come to a place in our life to where we understand, truly understand, just what Christ has done for you. And when you come to that place and you truly, truly realize it, your life will change forever. And not only will you work for God, you will desire to work for God. You will be compelled to work for God. When I am dreading not being here for the next, at least the next two Sundays. Dreading it. Why? Because this is what God has allowed me to do and what he has called me to do. And I hunger to do it every Sunday. Every Sunday. I look forward to coming here and sharing what God has shared with me every Sunday. I don't do it perfectly. Nobody does things perfectly. But I do it as God directs me to do it. And I am grieving, to tell you the truth, of not being able to be here. I don't 
come to church because I have to come to church. I come to church because I get to come to church. I could never, never repay Christ for what he has done in my life. Never. But I'm going to try. I'm going to try. We have discussed these gifts that God has for us. And we see a list over in 1 Corinthians. This is where I wanted you to go. 1 Corinthians 12, <coughs> verses 11, or 4 through 11, I'm sorry. Verses 4 through 11. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. Starting at verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Diversities, that means there's several different kinds of gifts. There are differences in, of ministry, but the same Lord. How many ministries do we have going on here in this church? Quite a few. Okay, quite a few. But we still have one Lord. Ugh, my nose is running, sorry. I know that, that's real good on tape, huh? <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> Verse 6. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. In other words, I'm going to say in the women's ministry. The women's ministry is presently he uh, headed up by Kathy. Okay? Kathy has a helper. That would be Deborah. She has other helpers, which would be my wife, Terry, which would be Edie, which would be other people doing different activities in that one ministry in order to make that ministry work. You see how the wheel works? It's very simple to understand. Man. Verse uh, 7. And this is a very important verse. If you, if you don't have a problem uh, writing or highlighting or whatever in your Bible, this would be one to highlight. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, each and every person who works in these ministries for God, for the profit of all. Of all. What I do in my ministry is not for my profit. It's for the profit of the church. What Kathy and, and her uh, 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 cohorts, if you will, do in, her, in that ministry are for the profit of all. In our men church that we do on Monday night, headed up by uh, Brent and uh, Chris, what they do in that ministry is for the good of all. And it's a growing ministry, by the way, guys. And so if you can join us there, Monday nights at 6.30, it's a great, great ministry. It truly is. We just came back from Mississippi on a, uh, on a uh, short john over there in order to uh, do man church, if you will, as a nationwide type thing or, I guess, a southern type thing. And there is one planned next year for Panama City, which we are planning on going to. So if you guys are, have an inkling of wanting to go and do that trip, uh, we're going to talk about it as we get more information. The Man Church is a great ministry. There's a bunch of us here that come to it. We had, I think, 11 or 12 last week. So it's a great ministry, and it is growing. Join us if you can. We, uh, Monday night, 6.30. Uh, get with Brent. Brent, raise your hand. Or Chris, back in the back. Raise your hand, Brother Chris. Okay. You get with those two guys, and they'll hook you up. My point is here... <clears throat> Whatever the ministry is that is working in the church is not for anyone's benefit, but it is for the benefit of all, all of the church. But see, not just of this church, also the church, which is the church we recognize, which is the only church that is spoken of in Scripture, which is the body of Christ, which is the body of believers, all believers. When we went to this uh, deal over in Mississippi, there were people from all over the country. There was a guy there from Alaska. Uh, there was a guy from a foreign country there, too, but I can't remember what it was. Kenya, a guy there from Kenya. And, I mean, there's people all over the world come to this. So it's going to be a great ministry. If you want to join us, just, like I said, get with Chris or, or Brent. All right. Verse 8. <clears throat> For to one is given the word of wisdom through a spirit. These are, the, these are a list of... Of, this, of the gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit. But understand, this is not an exhausted list. This is not all the list, and I'm going to share that with you. 
To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of the uh, tongues. Now look at verse 11. But one and the same Spirit, which is God's Holy Spirit, works all of these things, distributing to each one, each individual person, individually, as he wills. As he wills. I guarantee you 100%. God did not, does not want me to, to do the women's ministry. Okay? I'll also guarantee you that God does not want me to do the children's ministry. Though I love kids. I mean, I got seven, so, you know. God does not want me to do those ministries. That's not what he's called me to do. He has called my wife to do one. He has called Kathy to do one. He has called our secretaries to do one. There are many different ministries that make this church work. And you are called, as the Holy Spirit calls, to whatever ministry he calls you to. Do we get that? I hope you do. But there are many, many other gifts. There's not just these, this list. It's not an exhausted list. <clears throat> Such as, I mentioned children's ministry. Praise and worship ministry. We have several people who do our praise and worship. <clears throat> Secretaries, builders, plumbers, electricians. I had to put builders first because, you know, I'm a carpenter, right? <laughs> but... Uh, but, but what about bus drivers and coaches and teachers, you know, in our schools and stuff? Those are ministries. Those are ministries. People don't become a teacher just because they, uh, because, uh, they think it'll be uh, uh, very lucrative and, and they'll get rich, right? I don't, know of a, I don't know of a rich teacher. I wish they got paid more, but you see what I'm saying? They do it because God has put it on their heart to become a teacher, And on and on and on and on. Whatever gift you have, that gift has been given for the profit of all. For the profit of all. Do you imagine, or can you imagine, if our high school right up here, if there were no teachers, the kids are just going to go there and sit at desk all day? There has to be teachers, right? What if there were no bus drivers to get the kids there? Okay, these are, these, you, we don't think about these things, but they are ministries. They are ministries. Uh, Granny and Pappy, who m- many of you know, many of you don't know, been dear, dear friends of mine for many, many years, over 20 years. Granny, Pap, Granny has been a bus driver since I think there were buses. I mean, she's been a bus driver forever. Um, um, Rosemary, thank you. You knew who I was talking about. Rosemary just retired as a bus driver, over 40 years of bus driving. Who would want to put up with kids for 40 years? Okay, but she did. So see, she's called to that ministry. Do you see what I'm getting at? Okay, it's not something you do just because, well, I got nothing else to do. I guess I'll go drive a bus. You do it because God puts it on your heart to drive a bus. And on and on and on and on. But it is for the profit of all. Verse 7. We see that. <laughs> but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Very important to understand that. It is not about you. It is about God using you in his kingdom. Always remember, though, Paul is telling us in chapter 13, faith, hope, and love. Chapter 13, verse 13. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. Now, I showed you last week that over in 1 John 4, verses 8 and 16, it clearly tells us God is love. God is love. This particular chapter, chapter 13, which we use at weddings all the time, we know it as the love chapter. It is probably one of the most popular uh, chapters in the scriptures that women like to say, See what you see it? And they love to hear it. They love to hear it at their weddings. But guys, we should also. We should also love to hear it. 
because it is, it is speaking about what God grants us and how we can love our neighbor, which is what does God tell us and Jesus leaves us with the two last command, the two commands Christ leaves us with. One is to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, right? That is the first and the greatest of these. The second one is to love uh, your neighbor as you would have Christ love you, John 13, 34. So what that is telling us is, and Paul is telling us also, if I have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. So in other words, if we know God is love, if I do not have God, I am nothing. I am nothing. That love chapter is a, is a very, very enlightening chapter. So at your uh, leisure time, if you will, read. Don't read through, but read and comprehend the love chapter, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. But in chapter 12, which is right before uh, verse 31, which is right before chapter 13, I want you to see this. Paul is saying, but earnestly desire the best gifts. Earnestly desire the best gifts. You're going to, be, you're going to receive gifts. You may, see multiple, may receive multiple gifts from the Holy Spirit. I can preach the Word of God. I can teach the Word of God. I've been teaching Bible study on Wednesday nights for probably almost 20 years. Every Wednesday night. <clears throat> I can build you a house. I can't fix your car, so that's Chris's job. But, but I can build you a house from the ground up, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I have many gifts that I can use for God's kingdom. But my main gift that God has called me to do is to teach the word, not preach, teach the word of God. And that's what he's called me to do. That's what I want to do. And I have no other desire to do anything other than that is to teach the word of God. That's all I want to do for him. But I can do whatever else he needs me to do. And I have swept floors. I have clean toilets. I have, you know, whatever. I have, I'm not above doing anything for God. I do all things as unto the Lord. In 1231, he, Paul says, But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Then he goes into the scripture of love. The most excellent way is God, is having God and letting him lead God and direct your life. That's why he, we, he gets right in between 12 and 14. He, he brings the love chapter. He brings himself. God brings himself to the, to the center of, this, of these scriptures here in order to tell us that the best way is with God. That is the best way. God first and foremost. God is never second in your life. He has to be first and foremost. In chapter 13... Announcing the greatest gift is love. Over in 13.13, uh, 13, look at that. It says, and now abide, abide. What does abide mean? That means to be in. That means to stay in, be in, remain in. Don't, don't relinquish from, don't get out of. Stay in faith, hope, and love. If you want your, your ministry to succeed, if you want to succeed in God's kingdom, stay in faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, which is God himself. That means stay in God. Stay in God. Don't try to make God chase after you because he ain't going to. God is always standing at your door waiting for you to open the door. And he says, once you open the door, he will come in and live in you. The Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> then in chapter 14, chapter 14, Paul goes on. He, he, uh, he wants us to debate and understand two more gifts that are very, very important in our assisting God in building his kingdom. There's two more gifts that are very important to Paul and therefore very important to us. <clears throat> the two gifts are and can be and has been and will be evidently very controversial. They can be very misunderstood, but are very, very important in our own spiritual lives and for the church. 
far more important, one of them in particular, is far more important than I ever imagined, than I ever thought of. I knew it existed. I knew it was there. But it just didn't seem like it was, I, I don't want to say that big of a deal, but that's kind of the best way to, to put it. It just didn't seem like it was that important to me. And so I always had this question. Oh, you got to have it. You got to be able to do it. You know, on and on and on. And I thought, but I don't do it. And I have prayed to speak in tongues many, many times. And I will continue to pray and speak in tongues. But he hasn't given me that gift. He may not ever give me that gift. Why? Because he does not give that gift to everyone. And it is a gift of God. It is mentioned in our list of gifts over there in chapter 12. It is a gift given by the Holy Spirit, which is the speaking of tongues. It is a very vital, or has a very vital part in the church, just like prophecy does. And those are the two things that Paul is going to talk about here in chapter 14 is prophesying and the speaking in tongues. Now, there's been a lot of controversy over the years, and I'm going to give you a little back history on the speaking in tongues, where it came from, how it got started, on and on and on and on, and we'll get into that in just a second. But first, in verse 14 and 1, what are the first two words? Let's read those out loud. The first two words. Pursue love. What is love? Love is God. Okay? So what is first and foremost? Pursue God. Okay? He is always first and foremost. Pursue God. And then it says, desire spiritual gifts. In other words, then we're called to desire the gifts of God, whatever they may be, whatever he has in store for us, whatever he has planned for us, desire those gifts. Why? So that you can help build his kingdom. God, I want to know what gift you want you give to me or what you want to give to me so that I can know what you want me to do for your kingdom. I mean, a lot of us, and I have people all the time come to me and say, well, I don't know what the will of God is for my life. Well, the will of God, I can tell you, is over in four, uh, chapter uh, uh, 6, verse 40 and 41 of the Gospel of John, and it is for you to know Jesus Christ. That's, that's his will for your life, is to know Christ, which is to know God, which is to receive the Holy Spirit. That is the will that God has for your life. And secondly... The will for your life, your life is, is to do his good works, Ephesians 2.10. And so we are called to build his kingdom. God is not here building his kingdom. Jesus was here for 33 and a half years, but his ministry was only three and a half years long. And he built his kingdom in that 33 and a half, or in that three and a half years. And then he told his disciples, now it's on you. Because Why? Because I'm going back to dad. And that's exactly what he did. Over in Acts chapter 1, you'll see that he ascended into heaven. And the guys were sitting there going, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. He did go up. And then an angel appeared and says, why are you watching the way it goes? Don't you know he's coming back the exact same way? When he comes back? He is seated. Scripture tells us he is seated at the right hand of the Father. In the third heaven. Yes, there's three heavens. He is seated in the third head of it and at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus Christ is not walking this earth. But the Holy Spirit, who is also God and just as much God, is living inside each and every one of us and gives us the gift, the same gifts that Jesus had in order to build his kingdom. And those two perfect gifts that he wants us to have is to love the Father and to love our neighbor. Those are the two perfect gifts that he wants us to have while we walk this earth. And in doing so, we are also empowered with other acts, if you will, of, uh, of service in, as gifts in order to build his kingdom. Because Christ is not here building his kingdom. He is in the third heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. So it is up to you and up to me to build God's kingdom through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. If you have the Holy Spirit. I don't know. That's something only you and God know. 
<clears throat> then he says, but especially that you may prophesy. Prophesy. Now, this is a big question because usually whenever people see the word prophesy, they think, oh, well, I can't tell the future. This is not what prophesying is. Oh, well, I can't get a new revelation from God because there are no new revelations. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon tells us, okay? Because God has disclosed everything. Do you know this book that you have right here in front of you, I hope you have one, is a complete book. There is nothing that needs to be added to, and you dare not take anything from. Because if you read over in, in Revelation chapter 22, you'll see that Jesus says, if anything is added to or, or taken from this prophecy, the curses of this prophecy shall be on you. Don't be adding to or taken from, okay? Just believe the word. Believe the word. I'm going to show you a statement here in just a little bit that I that I learned not too long ago, and I, just, I have just absorbed it, and I, and I absolutely love it, and I stand on it, and I'll share it with you here in just a minute. So, I bet you didn't know that you were called to be a prophet, right? Is anybody, is anybody in here called to be a prophet that you know of? Actually, every one of you are. Every one of you are called to be a prophet. Now, I'm going to explain what a prophecy is. A prophecy is not predicting the future or even coming up with a new unknown information or revelation to give it to the world. That is not prophecy. <clears throat> the most desirable gift, again, is love. And after that, according to Scripture... The most desirable gift is to prophesy. Now, what is prophesying? Prophesying is the ability to speak or articulate, which is the same thing, God's word to another person in great cl clarity, accuracy, and understanding. To simply put it, it is to be able to speak God's word to others so that they will understand the truths of God. That's prophecy. That's prophecy. Well, I know in the Bible somewhere it says that God gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, you know, you'll be saved. Now, I don't know what it says word for word, and that's okay. But you still said the scripture with accuracy in a, in, in a kind of a paraphrase. Now, the, the scripture that we talked about a while back, Brent told me, he says, I've never heard anybody who can take three verses and, and do five teachings on it. But in, but in Matthew 8 and 28, where we see, and God uses all things for the good for those who are called according to his purpose and those who love him, right? Well, most people see that and they say, well, God can use everything for the good. That's not what the scripture says. That's inaccurate. That's a false teaching. That's a lie. Don't do that. If you don't know the scripture, don't recite the scripture. If you think you're going to recite the scripture, research it and make sure you're going to say the right thing. Because to pro prophesy God's word is to share God's word in accuracy to where someone can understand what you're saying. That's prophesying. That's going to lead us to where we need to go here in just a second. Simply to be able to speak God's word so that others will understand its truths. Boy, that's a powerful statement. I don't want anybody to try to teach me a lie out of God's word. Because his word is true. Every bit of it. You can't take parts of it out that you don't like or don't understand. It is a complete, it is the complete word of God. Don't add to, don't take from. As one of my most prized mentors said, and I've shared this with Chris before, and I'm not saying it exactly the way that he says it, but whenever he said this, I mean a, a board hit me across the head or a light bulb went off or whatever you want to call it. Maybe it went ding, I don't know. But it lit up my life whenever he said this. And this I stand on and will forever stand on. 
I don't know if many of y'all know who R.C. Sproul is, but R.C. Sproul is, has passed away. He died a few years back. I love, absolutely love, and highly recommend his teachings. Now, he is a, a, a professor of, um, uh, not only of theology, or was a professor of theology, uh, but uh, also, he had another doctorate or, uh, of something. I can't think of what it is now. It's not prophecy, but uh, anyway, he is the uh, president of Ligonier Ministry, which was or was the president of in uh, chancellor of Ligonier Ministry, which was down in Florida. He is a awesome, awesome Bible teacher, and he uses very, very big words because he's a professor. He's a doctor in theology and and on note. And so he uses very big words, but as long as I've been able to listen to him, he has taught me and said it clear enough that everything he has taught on, I have comprehended. I don't know what some of the words are, but he explains it in a way to where it just, it, it, it is understandable for me. And I can't explain that. But this is what he said a, a while back that just hit me like a, a board between the eyes. It says, as far and then he's a he's a teacher of, of preachers, if you will. He says, "I am commanded, commanded by God, to learn, to understand, and to teach God's holy word, as it is written, not as I want it to be written." Now, if you understand that, that is a profound statement. Okay. That's taking God's word, and well, I really don't think that that's what God's word says. That would be a lie, because God's word is true, and if we distort it in any way, shape, form, or fashion, then we are making it out to be a lie. If we're trying to change it to to suit us, to make us feel better, to make us smarter, or whatever you want to call it, that is a lie. God's word is his word. And it doesn't not need to be changed. Now, I know there's different translations. There's a lot of different translations. And there's a necessity for different translations. Okay, we here actually use the New King James Version because that's what God directed me to do. But understand what he is saying here. I am commanded by God. Commanded by God. To learn. Me learn. To understand. Me to understand. And to teach God's holy word as it is written, not as I have desired it to be written. Boy, what a profound statement. That means I can't deviate to suit me. Because it is what it is, and it is the truth. And I love that saying. And I, I, I'm going to live by that saying. All right, now we're going to, I'm going to blow you out of the saddle here. Look at verse 2. Look at verse 2, chapter and see, I only took about 10 minutes to do one verse. Okay? We've only got like 50 to go. But look at verse 2, and it won't take that long, I promise. Verse 2. But he who speaks in a tongue, now please look at this and understand this. But he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. But to God. For no one understands him, however, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, what is he saying here? Very, very simple. A spiritual language, which is a gift given to some, not to all, given to some, so that he or she speaks in a particular tongue, if you will, or language to God. To God. And we're going to go in depth in this here in just a second. So when people, I don't want to go there yet because we're going to get there in a little bit. Lord, keep me on line, please. Don't let me go down that trail. Uh, it, it's easy to do, let me tell you, because more of my mind is rolling. All right, so we're going to look here. We, we covered verse 1 and verse 2. It's very important that we understand this. Church, I'm telling you right now. Tongues is real. 
Speaking in tongues is real. And we're going to get in depth on that in a little bit, okay? But everybody will not and does not speak in tongues. It does not mean, it does not mean that if you do not, you do not have the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But if you do, it is a highly desirable gift. Gift. Because it is a gift of God. Verse 3 through 5. See, we're going to jump, kind of jump, jump, jump. Okay, so we won't go. We're going to go verse by verse because I'm going to share them all. But, but we're going to jump through some, okay, and kind of paraphrase it, if you will. So verse 3, three through 5. <laughs> But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation, which means, uh, you know, uplifting and, and uh, uh, encouraging, <laughs> exhortation and comfort to men. So he, who's, who, he who speaks the word of God. Okay, remember we talked about prophesying and speaking the word of God. It's for edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke in tongue, Paul says, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So let's understand what Paul is saying here. First and foremost, is it for that one person to be edified who speaks in tongues? No. It is for the benefit of all. So if he who speaks in tongues can interpret what they are saying, then it edifies the entire church because we all understand it. We understand what they're saying because it is not a language that we speak on a day-to-day -day basis, if you will. It is a spiritual language. But if we speak in our English, I'm going to say, then we speak and we edify the church by prophesying the word of God. I'm going to put it this way. If I spoke to you, and I'm going to get to this in a little bit too, but if I spoke to you the Word of God, and I told you, I spoke to you in, how about Hebrew? Hebrew, okay? Actually, the New Testament was written primarily in Greek. What if I spoke to you in Greek? Would anybody understand it? Does anybody speak Hebrew or Greek? Okay, well, then I'm all right. So, <laughs> well, I didn't know. Maybe you speak Hebrew or Greek. I don't know. But do you see what I'm saying? If I spoke to you in a language that you do not understand, there's no way you're going to understand it. Correct? Sure. I mean, it's pretty simple. So the person who speaks in the tongues needs to interpret what they are saying for those around them if they so desire, if they so desire, so that the other person who is around them is edified, understands. So if Rich is speaking in tongues, then I'm going to ask Rich, what were you saying? What, and what it is, it's what's in his heart, that he's speaking to God. It's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a cry out in prayer in a sense, okay? Because uh, you're speaking to God. You're not speaking to everybody else. You're speaking directly to God. That's what he tells us up here in two. It's speaking to God, not men. <clears throat> Six through nine. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall, it, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by teaching? If I don't come to you and tell you what I said, it does you no good, right? If I don't come and tell you what is on my heart, what is coming out of me, and this is, by the way, this is, this is generated by the Holy Spirit. It's not just something you do. It is generated by the Holy Spirit. It is God living inside of you. Do you remember the scripture that says, even when we're distraught and we know not what to pray for, the Holy, the Holy Spirit prays or intercedes on our behalf. Well, there you are. So this is exactly what it is about. It is not about something that we can just say, okay, well, I choose to speak in tongues and start speaking in tongues. Okay, because I don't know what I'm doing. It has to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's the same way that I could not teach the Word of God unless the Holy Spirit taught me. Because I ain't smart enough. This peanut brain ain't, ain't, enough to, ain't big enough to handle all this stuff. That's why I have to do it all the time because 
<laughs> there's no way I could know it all. I would love to know it all, but there's just no way. There's so much to learn, so much to learn. And I've been teaching here since we started the church thir almost 13 years ago now. I've been doing Bible study for almost 20 years. And I, there's so much more for me to learn. So much more. So unless I speak in a language I can understand, or unless my mentors, if you will, speak to me in a language I can understand, it does me no good. So it is the same way that he who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets for those around him, it does no good. But in that prayer time that that person is, let's say, praying, does it edify them? You better believe it does, because it makes a connection with God. It's a special. Wouldn't you like to be, wouldn't you like to know that you are connected with God? Well, actually, you are. Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, or better, or I hope it does. So this is very important that we understand this. Verse 7. <clears throat> Even things without life, whether a flute, or, he, got, he goes on talking about, um, you know, drums and instruments and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm just going to paraphrase this real, real quick. If, if you took a drum and it's not in, even a drum, and it's not in tune, and you hit it, it'll make a rattle, it'll make a sound that is not clear, right? If you take a, 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 a trumpet or a flute, like it says, and you, you ever try to take, blow a trumpet? Anybody ever try to blow a trumpet? Boy, it ain't easy. I mean, you got to get them lips just right and whatever, you know, and it's difficult. Well, if you don't do it just right, you, nobody wants to hear it. But if you do it just right, I mean, one of the greatest trumpet, I'm going to call it songs because I think, think, can't think of what you call it, that, that touches my heart every time I hear it is taps. When I know a soldier has, has passed away and they play taps, I mean, tears my heart out. Tears my heart out. But if that person who is playing taps does not know how to blow that trumpet, I don't want him to even pick it up. And this is exactly what Paul is saying. He's saying, unless when you teach, unless people understand what you're doing and what you're saying and the message you're trying to get across, it's of no avail to the kingdom of God. Verse 8, for if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Who, who will know what it's supposed to mean? So likewise, you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. Now, what this brings up, a lot of times in our natural self, if you will, or our sin, I'm going to say actually in our sin nature, because I really think of it this way. If we are trying to show everyone else how holy we are by speaking in tongues in front of everybody and standing on a soapbox, if you will, or trying to get in front of everybody and say, see how holy and righteous I am by the things that I do and the things that I mumble? If you're trying to do that, I would call that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit myself. Okay? I would be very, very careful of that. Because Brent will testify, it ain't about you, right? It's not. It is about God. And if you're trying to edify yourself in front of others, Jesus himself even said, then that's the reward you're going to get because you will get no reward from heaven for it. Not one. So don't, don't try to be what you're not. Be what God, what God has called you to be. Okay? And it may be a floor sweeper. There's nothing wrong with sweeping the floor. I'm thankful for a floor sweeper. Terry came into the house the other night. It's been gone a month and a half. And she goes, wow, the floor has been swept. Because I swept it before she got home. But then she goes in the bathroom. She goes, oh, my gosh. Well, I'm not a good bathroom person. Now. What can I say? But the floor was swept. Thank God for floor sweepers. You ever think about your, your garbage man who picks up your trash every week? How many times have you gone out there and thank you for your job? Okay. You know what I like to do? This is what I, I really like to do. 
You go to a restaurant, and of course you can tell I really love to eat, okay? All right, you go to a restaurant. You're gonna tip your waitress most likely, right? If the food's good and service good, blah, blah, blah. What about the guy that comes by and cleans the table? I like to go up to the, what do they call those? Bus boys, thank you. I knew there was a word, I couldn't think of it. Okay, bus, bus boys or bus ladies or whatever. All right, I like to go up to them and slip them a $10 bill or whatever and say, thank you for what you do. Because without you, I wouldn't have a clean table to eat on. Appreciate the people who never get appreciated. Boy, you want to be, you want God to smile at you? Appreciate the people that never get appreciated. But without them, we would suffer greatly. You want to go eat on a dirty, filthy table? Well, I don't either. I don't either. So that person that does that job, nobody ever says thank you. Oh, you were such a good server today. Thank you very much. Here's a 20. Here's a, well, I know some of you rich people. Here's a, here's 30, 40, 50 bucks. I give $2, you know, because that's probably all I got left. But anyway, no, I don't. But that person who is cleaning the bus in that table, how many times have you ever, if you're able to, look back in the kitchen and say, hey, Cookie, thank you. How many times do we appreciate the people we'd never appreciate? Think about that. That's why I brought up the, the trash man. Think about that job. Would you do that job? Most people won't. Most people won't. But thank that trash man for picking up your trash, or else you sure have you would sure have a trashy place. Don't come look at mine. I don't have a trash man. All right. Uh, if you receive information from God, this is verse six through nine, from God that would help the church by looking at different ministries, by you learning or 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 or. Uh, Something that you, by learning something that the church hasn't thought of or that you have discovered by talking with others outside of your church, share it. If there's a ministry that you are really, really feeling that God is leading you to, share it with me. Share it with Chris. We want to get as many ministries going as possible in order to build God's kingdom. Now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of money because we don't have a whole lot of money, but we'll do what we can. All right? We'll discuss it. We'll talk it over with the church in our business meetings, and we'll take it from there. <clears throat> but you only use words that we can understand. You know, don't, don't come here and try to say, well, I want to do this ministry, and, and it's, uh, I don't know, let's say over in Africa or India or China or something like that, and you start uh, saying, well, you know, in China they do that. Well, I'm not going to understand that stuff. I don't know anything about China. But if you do, share it with us. And if we can make that ministry happen, and y'all want to make that ministry happen, we will. There are many things that I haven't thought of. When we have our business meeting, I say each and every time, you are welcome. You don't have to be a member of the church. You're welcome to come to our business meeting because we want your ideas. We want you to help us build God's church. You may not be a member of this church, and that's okay. We still want your ideas. Brenda, I know you're covered up, but I am burning up. Is everybody else hot in here? Do we need to turn the air down a little bit or the fan's on? I see you're fanning. I'm roasting. Is that a no or a yes? Are you cold? All right. All right. I don't know if I will. If I pass out, Johnny, come up here and finish. All right. All right, verse 10 through 14. <clears throat> there are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world that none of them is, is without significance. And there is. Every language spoken throughout the world has significance. Maybe not for you or me, but it has it for someone. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will for, be a foreigner to me. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Again, it's for the church, for the profit of all, not just for you. Therefore, let him who speaks in the tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. Look at there. My spirit prays. My spirit prays. This is real. It's not not real. It's real. 
For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. My understanding is unfruitful because I'm speaking in a language that even I don't really truly understand unless the Spirit t- interprets it for me. Okay? The Spirit living inside you will tell you what you are actually saying, what is on your heart, because that's where God lives. You cannot simply sit there and tell me that this syllable, if you will, means this, and this syllable means that, this syllable means that, because it's not a written, known language. It is a spiritual language that God knows. And it says right here that since you are zealous in the spiritual, uh, actually it's up a little bit, right? No. Uh, spiritual, where, did I, where did I say that at? Okay, it was 12. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek excel, uh, seek to excel. Uh, verse 13, Therefore, let him who speaks in the tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, this is it, this is what I was looking for, my spirit prays. My spirit prays. But my understanding is unfruitful and it's unfruitful for the church unless I can interpret it. It does not benefit anybody else. And we're called to be fruitful for God's church. Verse 15. Verse 15 stands alone. It stands by itself. What is the conclusion then, Paul says? I will pray with the Spirit and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit And I will also sing with understanding. Paul is simply saying this. He is saying, uh, between me and God, I choose to to pray in the Spirit between me and God. I want that connection. I want that conversation between me and God. The Holy Spirit lives in me and God himself. But for your sake, I will also pray in the known language that we all speak. So that you will understand. And then, of course, he says sings, which means praise. I will sing praise in the Spirit. That means I will lift my hand and praise God for all that he has done and doing in my life. And I will do it in tongues. I will do it to God directly. But then it also says that I will also lift my hands and praise God in the language that that we know, let's say, so that we may all join together in praising God. It's called corporate prayer. It's called corporate praise. We open up every Sunday with that. We have five, six songs, whatever it is, and we're going to have one song at the end, just like that. We're going to do it. We're going to praise God for what he has done at the end of our service today. We're going to give him thanks. We're going to give him praise. But there's certainly nothing wrong with doing it in tongues as well. Because that is your connection. That is a personal connection. Between you and God. And it is a special gift. It is a special gift. I wish I had it, but I don't. Otherwise, verse 16, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place... uh, of the uninformed say amen. In other words, how in the world, if you simply do it in the Spirit, how am I going to agree with you? See, we do corporate prayer on the fourth Sunday of every month. What that corporate prayer is, is that we all come together as one, join hands, and we pray for whatever is on our hearts, and we all agree with it. We stand in agreement. We pray as one. We say the amen. Amen simply means, let it be as you have said. Well, if I don't understand what you said, how am I going to say amen to what you've said? So you must interpret for me. Verse 16 through 19. Otherwise, if you you are blessed with the Spirit, how will you, how will he who occupies the place of, of uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? I just gave you that for you indeed give thanks well that means whenever he says you indeed give thanks well means that i'm gonna put it this way had a boy way to go 
I mean, you have that connection with God, and you are praising God and thanking God in, in a language that I don't have, that I wish I did have. But the other is not edified. We can't edify somebody else with, if they don't understand it. I thank God. Here's Paul saying, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Well, if Paul spoke in tongues, don't you think it would probably be a pretty good idea if we could? I pray for it, but it'll be up to the Holy Spirit to give it to me. Yet in the church, I would, watch this now. Yet in the church, and I'm going to say in the English-speaking church as we are in here. In the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in tongues. Now, what is he saying? Is he saying tongues is useless in the church? Not at all. What he is saying is, is that I would rather speak five words of the truth of God so that you may, be un so that you may understand and you may be edified and you may come closer to God because I spoke five words than a thousand words that you would not understand. This is why prophecy in our church is so important. And not only in our church, but outside of the church. You take these things that you learn and you take it outside the church. Can you take tongues outside the church? Most certainly. But is somebody going to understand it? No. Prime example. In the church, Brother Arturo does our Spanish uh, service. Okay? He speaks very little English. He's a great friend of mine. We've been friends for a long time. I love his brother. I've been to his wedding. Uh, I, uh, I know of his two brothers. I mean, I've known him for a long time. But I don't understand most of what Arturo says because he doesn't speak good English. No, no disrespect. And I don't speak any Spanish. Very little. So he doesn't understand me. So what do we need? We need an interpreter. Brother Raul back there. Very fluent in Spanish, very fluent in, in English. And whenever I need to convey something to Raul or him to me, we need our interpreter to do it. This is exactly the example that Paul is giving. The exact example. Spanish is an awesome worldwide language. English is an awesome worldwide language. But not everybody speaks English. Not everybody speaks Spanish. But we have an interpreter in here. And he can share, and we can converse back and forth through our interpreter. This is what Paul is saying. Speaking in tongues is an awesome gift. It is a necessary gift. It is a, a blessed gift. But it's not the only gift. It's just one of many. One of many. Here Paul explains that speaking in tongues is a way of lifting up your praise and your prayers to God in a worshipful, worshipful way. But those who don't understand cannot agree with the amen because we don't understand it. We don't understand it. So the church, in the church, it is of no, valuable, no value to speak out except to edify yourself. And there's nothing wrong with you speaking in church to God. Right? Do you find anything wrong with speaking to God in church? Well, certainly not. So if you do it in tongues, or if you do it in English, or if you do it in Spanish, or whatever you do it in, it's still speaking to God. And there ain't nothing wrong with it, friend. There's nothing wrong with it. It is far better to share God's word with understanding, though, that it may benefit all. That's why in here, we speak in English. In our Spanish service, he speaks in Spanish. And yes, we don't have a lot of people who come to our Spanish service, but there's a lot of people who watch it. Okay? All right, verse 20 through 21. I'm going to try to go through this a little bit faster. We've only got about six or seven hours left. All right, verse 20. Brethren, do not be children of understanding, however in malice. However in malice. Be babes. But in understanding, be mature. For the, in the law it is written, with men 
with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to these people. And yet, for all that, they will not hear me. They will not hear me. Now, what Paul is trying to get at here is, is that we must understand <laughs> and have discussed that in the first century, tongues were spoken by all who received the Holy Spirit. In the first century, tongues were spoken, and all who, who spoke in tongues received the Holy Spirit. We saw that in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. The Jews, the Samaritans, the God-fearers, and the Gentiles all spoke in tongues upon receiving the Holy Spirit. Throughout the church history, though, from the first century all the way up into the late 19th century, which would be the 1800s. Evidence of tongue speaking are very, very, very faint. Very faint. When I was studying through this, there's a little bit about it in the uh, second and third century and a little bit about it in the fifth century, and that's all I could find. So it's very, very, very faint. Nowhere in Scripture does it state or imply that Christ ever spoke in tongues. Why is that? Because God, as Christ speaks directly to the Father, right? If you look, look over in John 17 and in several other places, he says, Father, I thank you that you hear me, but it is not for the benefit of you hearing me. It is for the benefit of others hearing, right? But Christ never spoke in tongues. And in the early to mid 20th century, which is in the 1900s, the charismatic movement tried to uh, tried to take hold uh, of the um, oh man I'm dry mouth sorry tried to take uh, in the charismatic movement they tried to take uh, hold due to the mundane somber preaching take hold that's right of the mundane somber preaching in other words in the early 1900s there was no excitement in the preaching. It was kind of like, God loves you. You must believe in God to be saved. And if you listen to those sermons back then or ever read those sermons back then, you'll see that they're pretty dry. Now, I'm not a great uh, preacher or theologian or anything like that, but I try to make it a little bit of put a little bit of laughter, a little bit of excitement in it. A little, I get excited about it and try to put a little bit of humor here and there, you know. Uh, I mean, you can, I know God has a, uh, a sense of humor because I see it in the mirror. But um, I, I try to make it a little bit more enticing so you don't fall asleep. But at, back in the turn of the century, in the, in the 20th century, which is the 1900s, the, um, they tried to get this movement started because there was, there was no... I'm going to put it this way. There was no feeling of the Holy Spirit in the church. It was just blah. I guarantee you there was plenty of people in the church that said, pay your money. There was very little excitement over being a Christian, over receiving the Holy Spirit, of following God. There's very little. In 1906 and up, until just after World War I, this movement vaguely took hold. First, it started out actually in Topeka, Kansas. Can you believe that? I mean, this is the history I researched, and it started out in Topeka, Kansas. Does anybody live in Kansas? I mean, I guess so. But it started by a guy, by, it was started by a guy, started by a guy named Charles Fox Parham. And a lady by the name of Agnes Osnam, O-Z-N-A-M, so I'm presuming that's how you say it, was the first student of Mr. Parham to speak in tongues. Then others followed, and Parham declared, back around the turn of the century in the 1900s, he declared, he declared that the glossolalia, the glossolalia, which means speaking in tongues, was the initial evidence of the true baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is where it came from. He believed that this is where the truly true baptism of the Holy Spirit comes from. Many churches took a hold of this, and they said, if you don't speak in tongues, you do not have the, the uh, uh, Holy Spirit. And so it all started with Mr. Parham. This led to many other renowned uh, Pentecostal evangelists, such as Mary Woodworth Etter, 
Charles Price, Amy McPherson, and this one you would know, Oral Roberts, and of course many, many, many others. Today there are many who believe that in speaking in tongues is the sign of the spirit baptism. And they seem to chastise those who don't speak in tongues. Then there are these that don't, uh, that don't speak in tongues, chastise those who do. So what it has done is it has caused a conflict between the church. Well, if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not, you're not a part of the church. Well, if you do speak in tongues, you are a part of the church. That's not true. That's not true. Scripture tells us over and over and over again. I gave it to you over in the book of Acts. We saw the, uh, the uh, Pentecost, the, the event of Pentecost, that it actually happened about four times. First in chapter 2, when the Jews received the Pentecost in the upper room, or received the Holy Spirit in the upper room, the day of Pentecost. There's only one day of Pentecost, by the way. But then there were three other events in Scripture. Chapter 8 is where the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. And the sorcerer said, man, I've never seen such power before. I want to buy some of that. And Peter says, "Uh uh-uh. And then over in chapter 10, when Peter went into Cornelius' house, and they all, the, he was a Roman officer, by the way, of the Roman soldiers, and he, was, he and all of his household and all of his friends that gathered, they all received the Holy Spirit, and they all spoke in tongues that moment. Over in chapter 19, in, this, in the uh, church of Ephesus, the uh, Holy Spirit came upon the church of Ephesus, and they all spoke in tongues. So it is not a matter of... <coughs> of only if you belong to a certain organization or a certain faith or whatever that you can speak in tongues or not. It does not matter if you speak in tongues or not and whether you receive the Holy Spirit. What matters is if you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's what Word says. That's what the Word says. We must preach the Word as it is written, not as we want it to be. And that is the problem that we have in our nation. And it has caused conflict galore. Conflict, conflict galore. Verse 22 through 25. Therefore, tongues are a sign. Here we go. Tongues are a sign. Not for those who believe. Not for those who believe. But for unbelievers. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. If, if you are an unbeliever and you came into this church... And I'm just going to put it this way, and we can look over in chapter, and we're going to see it here in a minute. But we can look over in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Over there, where, uh, after the day of Pentecost, and they were all speaking in tongues, people came in, and they goes, man, these folks are drunk. And Peter comes back and says, no, it's only 9 in the morning. They're not drunk. They've received the Holy Spirit, and they're speaking in tongues. And we're going to see that here again here in just a second in this scripture. That if somebody walked in here who was a non-believer and we were all jumping around and running around and speaking in tongues and, and the stuff like that, and that is not what speaking in tongues entails, by the way, okay? But if we were all acting like a fool, they would think we were drunk. But we're not going to be acting like a fool. We don't do that. And you'll see why in just a second. But if somebody walks into this church, like right now, like right this very second, and I can see every eye in this, in this auditorium, every eye in this, uh, in this um, wherever we're at, sanctuary, thank you, I couldn't think of the name. If I can see every eye looking and, and being intently tied into what is being taught here today, and somebody walks into this room, they're going to go, wow, this must be the Word of God being spoke here. They're going to sense the Word of God is being spoke here. Because the Word of God is being spoke here. And it's understandable. And so they would be in tune, be in tune to hearing the word of God. And in hopes, it would take root and manifest itself in them. And they would become believers and children of God. See? But if everybody was in here speaking in tongues, people would walk in here. Let's put it this way so it's better understandable. Okay? If you came to the Spanish service, and I mean, it is a great service. Okay? But if you came to the Spanish service and you did not speak Spanish... You'd come in here and go, what the heck are these people talking about? You wouldn't have a clue. Well, it's the same way that if everybody in here was speaking in tongues. Somebody, oh, ouch. A non-believer comes in, and uh, everybody would say, 
man, these people are crazy. That's exactly what they thought over in, uh, in Acts 2. Whenever he came in, they said, these people are drunk. Here in 23, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there are those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that they are out of their mind? That's what the Word of God says. All right? I just shared that with you. But if all prophesy, speaking the Word of God, and an unbeliever or uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. In other words, he'll understand what is going on and possibly, possibly, not condemned now, he will be convicted of his sins and decide to become a child of God and get rid of that sin. Amen? And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. You see the difference? If an unbeliever comes in here and we're all speaking in tongues, he's just going to walk right back out. But if, an un, if a believer comes in here and sees that we're all prophesying the word of God, then they'll stay. If an unbeliever comes in here and sees that we're prophesying the word of God, speaking and teaching the word of God, they will stay in order that their heart and their soul be convicted and they understand that there is salvation even for that person. Even for that person. Now, there's nothing wrong, and I'm going to put it this way, in an English service, in speaking in tongues, at all. As a matter of fact, I think it's kind of cool the more I've understood it. I think it's pretty awesome, and I would love to be able to do it. But God has not given me that gift. But to raise your hands and know that you are speaking directly to God, if you will, that's pretty, pretty fascinating to me. And I would love to have that gift, but I don't have it yet. We must understand, like in Acts 2, they thought that they would be crazy, thought they would be drunk, out of their mind, etc., etc., etc. All right? But look over at 14.2. 14.2. 14.2 says, For he who speaks in the tongues does not speak to men, but to God. I love that scripture when I found that. I love that scripture. He who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. Man, I want to know God is hearing me. Everything that is on my heart. And I think that's the avenue to do it. I, I, he, already, he, he already knows my heart. But I want to tell him. Therefore, as a sign to the uninformed, he shall know that the Holy Spirit is upon the church and available to him upon his surrender if he understands what's going on. If he can't understand it, it's of no value to the kingdom of God. Prophecy carries much more power in our church, okay, if all are speaking and understanding God's word, where there is no need for an interpreter. Instead, a few speaking in tongues and in need of an interpreter. It's fine if, you, if you're in our congregation, if you will, and as far as I'm concerned, if you speak in tongues, I think it's a glorious gift that I wish I had. And I am thankful that you have it. But as far as the overall church, we have to speak in understanding, okay, to edify the entire church because it's not about us. It's about all. Remember that? He further explains in 26 through 31. 26, we're almost done. We only got two hours left. 26 through 31. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you uh, has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification, for lifting up, for encouraging, for exhortation, okay? For building the church, building the individuals of the church, because that's what the church is. The church is not this building. It's individuals in the church, Okay? If someone speaks in the tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, 
let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Okay, so see it again. It says you're speaking right to God. How wonderful would that be? I pray I know someday. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Now, not that uh, Chris can speak up here. Rahul's going to speak up here. I speak up here. Others speak up here. We have guests that speak up here. And then you guys benefit. This is not my church. This is God's church. I just do my part in this church. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let him first be, keep silent. For you can always prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subjective to the prophets. Now, this is something we need to understand. I, was, I asked the Lord, I said, now wait a minute, Lord, what are you talking about here that the spirits have subjected to the, to the prophets? Okay, remember what prophesying is. Prophesying is speaking the word of God. What this is simply saying is, God does not, the Holy Spirit does not possess anyone to where they get into a frenzy of trying to flail around or flounder like a fish on the floor or run around the room. That is not what God calls for his church to do. Okay? It is not in there. Matter of fact, Paul's going to talk about it here in a little bit more. It is not that the Holy Spirit possesses us, that we walk around and throw ourselves on the floor or, or do any of this other shenanigans, I'm going to call it. Okay? That is not what it's about. That's a show. That's something that, is, that God actually forbids. We're going to see it in just a second. He actually forbids that. So if you're involved in anything like that, you do what you want to do. But it is my suggestion that you not do that. Because that is not what God calls his church to do. It's very important that we understand that. Verse 33. Highlight it, underline it. For God is not, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. When people get I'm just going to say this. I don't, I'm not judging anybody because that's between them and God. But when people start acting, a, I'm going to say the way I feel, okay? When people start acting a fool in church, they're simply putting on a show to try to show others how, how holy they are, how possessed they are by the Holy Spirit, how, how the, uh, the Spirit has just just taking them out of their selves and put some, something else in them. But if you read and study through scriptures and through the history of the church, those people who do that are actually practicing a demonic, a demonic spirit in them, not the Holy Spirit. Because God does not possess, he is not going to possess Rick to jump up and run around and be disruptive in his church. Because he is a God of order. He is a God, not of confusion, but of order and peace. So if you're causing a big shenanigan in the church, I would highly recommend that you stop. Now, I had a lady come to us one time a long time ago. And God is always, not always, I wish he had many years ago, but he didn't. He got a hold of me several years ago and whenever I started this church. And he told me certain things whenever I needed to know certain things. And he continues to doing that. I had a lady come into our church one time. She says, Pastor, I just want you to know I'm full of the Spirit. And if I get up and start running around, you know, that's just how it is. It's just the Spirit possessing me. And I said, lady, if you're going to get up and run around, I want you to run right out the door. And I don't want you in here. Because God, and I knew this before I even, I told you a while ago when I first started. I have been wondering about the speaking in, in tongues for a long, long time. And I have asked God and prayed God to reveal it to me on and on and on. And he will reveal to you what you need to know when he wants you to know it. And not before. And I told this lady, I said, if you're going to get up and try to do that stuff, you need to just run on outside. And I don't care if you run up and down 274. But you're not going to do that in here. Because God is a God of order. Not of confusion. Not of show. Not of, hey, look at me. And we won't have that in here. 
She sat. She went through the service. She never came back. That's okay. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints. You see that? As in all the churches of the saints. If you're in God's church, he is not a God of disorder. He's not a God of, dis of confusion. He is a God of order. Okay? So we will have an orderly worship service. And if you want to be disruptive, you better disrupt yourself out of here. Verse 34. Well, I got way ahead of my notes. 34 through 36. Now, ladies, don't throw anything at me, please. I know we're running along, but I don't have much left to go. Okay. This scripture, I want to explain this scripture for you before you say, I don't think so. Okay. God is not, and Paul is not, saying, women, please pardon me, okay? This is just the way the Lord gave it to me this morning. Sit down and shut up. That is not what he is saying. And I want to show you why, okay? Go over to uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. Everybody there? Should be able to find it real quick. 1 Corinthians 11, 5. This is speaking... Paul, same Paul, same preacher here, speaking to women. But every woman who prays and prophesies. But every woman who prays and prophesies. You're allowed to pray and prophesy in church just like I am. Everyone who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is the one and the same as if her head was shaved. Now, that's getting into a different teaching, and if you want to know about all that, but I wanted you to see that prayer, prophesying, which is speaking the Word of God, is allowed in church. It says it right there. Now, if you want to know about the covering of heads and all that, I actually just recorded that. Uh, yesterday, Chris and I did uh, four recordings. Four recordings, so we're caught up until the end of May, in case I can't come back. On RCC Bible Study TV, I'm teaching the book of Corinthians. So, and I just taught this yesterday. So we're not going to get into that, but just to understand, I guess you got to wait to the end of May because that was like our third or fourth teaching, I believe. Uh, but I want you to understand, women are allowed to speak in church. Okay? But what did Paul say back over here in uh, 13 or 14? He says, Let your women keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak. Well, now, wait a minute. He just said over there in 11.5 that they can pray and prophesy in church. So this is kind of confusing, maybe. So we're going to straighten it out in just a second. But they are to be submissive, as to the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or did the word of God orig come originally from you? Or was, pardon me, or was it you only that it reached? Now, again, Paul said that, not me, okay? I'm just reading the words. So actually, God said this. Let me explain what he is talking about, if you will. In the church of Corinth, which Paul started, I shared this with you in the very beginning, which Paul started, he taught correct theology. He taught correct doctrine, okay? It was infallible. It was perfectly taught. The other people came into the church and started causing corruption, started causing problems in the church. And the women of the church of Corinth, not Rock and Country Church, the women of the church of Corinth started gossiping and slandering and causing all kinds of issues that were really, really detrimental to the teaching of the word or the prophesying of the word so that it would be heard and understood correctly. Such as chatter, 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 chatter. Did you see what Terry had on today? Boy, I hate those shoes. Why would she ever wear those shoes? Okay, that's chatter, chatter, chatter about something that has nothing to do with God. 
It has nothing to do with the church. It is actually disruptive to the church. When we get up from during our teaching, now I understand that somebody talks too long sometimes. I get that. I don't know who that would be. But when we have to get up and go to the facilities, if you will, or when we're freezing and we have to get up and go get a blanket or whatever, I, I understand that from time to time you have to move around, get up, whatever, whatever. That's understandable. But to do it and to chatter and to just talk and, and not pay attention or to be late, co- no offense, brother, or to be late coming in or to, <laughs> we're always giving him grief over that, or, or to still be talking when the lights come on. Do you know why those lights come on? Blink. They come on because it says it's time to start. And believe me, I tell the folks here, 10 o'clock, it's 10 o'clock. It's not 10.01. It's not 10.02. It's 10 o'clock. And so I'm asking you politely, come in before 10 o'clock. Have a seat. We close the kitchen early for this very reason. Come in, have a seat. Be ready to go before the lights come on. Because when the lights come on, we're to worship God. We're not to be chitter-chatting, visiting, blah, blah, blah. We're to be worshiping God. Okay? That's when we start our worship, friend. And it's very serious. To me, it's extremely serious. Because I want to be in touch with God. And this is one way that we are in touch with God is by our praise and worship team doing exactly that, praising and leading us in worship. And it starts, just so that you know, at 10 a.m. sharp. Okay? That's as politely as I can put it. Try to be ready at 10 before the lights come on. That is a sign to start. We're going to be finished here in just a second. I know I keep saying that, but we are. All right, verse 37. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge those things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Are the commandments of the Lord. Verse 37. If anyone believes God's truths, let him acknowledge to others and share with others those truths he believes in. Do not let somebody sway you from believing what you say you believe. If you believe it, believe it and stand on it. If you don't believe it, then don't accept it and don't use it. But if you believe it, then accept it and believe it and share it. Share it. We have to share the Word of God. We're called to share the Word of God. You're called to be a prophet which is to share the Word of God correctly and truthfully. Verse 38, if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. What is Paul saying there? If you don't believe, fine, don't believe. (laughs) It's fine. You don't want to believe the Word of God? Don't believe the Word of God. Do you know what ignorant means? Ignorant means that you are uninformed. It's not really a slang word. But it means that you're uninformed. It means you don't know what you're talking about and you don't know what you're missing. Now, the way I like to put it is you don't know what you don't even know. You don't know what you don't know. But when you believe, when you start believing and letting the Holy Spirit speak to you and teach you and show you and guide you and direct you, man, he'll open up things in scriptures that, you have, that you've never thought about seeing. It is amazing. But if you want to stay ignorant, go ahead. No big deal. Verse 39. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. To prophesy. Not to speak of things of the future, but to speak the words of God, the truths of God. Desire to be able to do that. And do not forbid. Hear this. Do not forbid the speaking with tongues. Don't forbid it. It is not for you to judge someone else, period. We're no one's judge. And if someone has that communication, that gift, by all means, let them do it. I have no problem with it whatsoever. Matter of fact, I don't want to say I'm envious, but that's a better word. I'm envious because I'd love to be able to do it. But he hasn't given it to me yet, and I pray someday he will. Verse 31. Uh, wait a minute, <laughs> 31, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Verse, verse 40, 
Let all things be done decently and in order. You see that? Decently in order. Does that mean that you were supposed to get up and run around and hoop and holler and do all that kind of crazy stuff? Now, again, I'm not trying to judge those folks. Whatever turns them on, turns them on. But that's not what Scripture says. And I have shared with you the Word of God. God is, a God, is not a God of confusion or disorder. He is a God of faith, hope, and love, which he tells us over in 1331, or 1313. He is the God of faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is himself, which is love. And you can choose to love, and you can choose or refuse not to love. I personally, I personally choose love. I choose God. I want God to love me with all that he has and all that he is. And in turn... I'm in hopes that he will realize how much I love him. I mess up over and over and over. I don't do it perfectly. But I want God to know how thankful I am, how appreciative I am. And I do that by doing what he's called me to do, which is to serve you. And the best way I know and the best way that I know he has called me to serve you is to share the word of God with you as he shares it with me. You may agree, you may disagree. That's totally up to you. But I can only share with you what God shares with me. And I share with you his love, which is God. And I pray you will choose love because it is the greatest of these. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for all that you do for myself, for my family, for my country, for our congregation, for all those who are in this congregation and all of their families, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will continue pouring your Holy Spirit out on each and every one of us. Lead, guiding, and directing our lives, Lord, so that we may build your kingdom as you call us to build it. Father, we are here and we are willing to serve you as you have called us to serve. But we need that direction. And the only way to get that direction is to get the Holy Spirit. To have that Holy Spirit living inside of you, talking with you, and conversing with you, communing with you each and every day. And the scripture tells us that there is no way that you're going to get God, which is also the Holy Spirit. There's no way you're going to get him unless you first come through the Son, which is Jesus Christ. So, friend, you must accept Christ. You must accept Christ in order to have the Holy Spirit. If you do not have the Son, you do not have the Father. If you do not have the Father, you do not have the Son. Jesus tells us that if you accept the Holy Spirit, I and the Father will come and live in you in the form of the Holy Spirit. That's how it works. So today I ask you to examine yourself. Today you have heard the Word of God. Today you have heard the truths of God right out of the book. And I pray that you have and or will accept Christ to be your Lord and Savior right this, at this very moment. It's very simple to do, but it is a hard road to live because it is tough. But you can do it. Why? Because you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living in you to help you do it. Wow, what a, what a blessing. How do you do it? You simply call on Jesus' name, but mean it in your heart. You just simply say, Dear Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. I know I've messed up all of my life. And I know that I can't do everything perfect, but it is my desire for you to live in me, guide and direct me from this moment on in the precious work that the Father puts on my life in order to please him. So I ask you, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Savior. And it's in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. 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 God bless you all. God bless you all. I pray that you have accepted Christ as the Holy Spirit. He is your Savior. 
you have welcomed him into your life. And if you have, I guarantee you, if you will just listen to him, he will take you to a, a, a life that is worth living, a life that is prosperous in many ways, a life that is blessed over and over and over, all the way to a life of eternal bliss with him in his presence. Amen? Amen. God bless you all. If anybody needs prayer whatsoever, come forward and let us pray with you. What you got, Tater Tot? Your dad? All right, let's pray for your dad. All right, we're going to anoint you again, okay? All right. Thank you, Mike. Heavenly Father, we lift up uh, Bobby to you, Lord, and he's, stand, he's come forward several times praying for his dad. And Father, we ask you to touch his dad's soul. Touch that very soul of his dad and, and lead him unto yourself, Father. We know that you're the one that can do it. You're the only one that can do it. But we come together and, and lift him up to you, Lord, asking you to touch his life, bring him unto yourself, so that Bobby will be even more happy with his daddy. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you, brother. God bless you. Anybody else? Crystal? All right. Oh. I promise not to cough on you, okay? <laughs> You don't care, do you? <laughs> you have a, no, I won't say it. You have a lot of guts. <laughs> Father God, we lift up Crystal to you, Lord, and we're continually lifting her up. We're not going to stop, Lord. We call on you, Lord, to heal her. Now, your word says that if we call on you, that you will answer our prayers if we ask it in Jesus' name. So in Jesus' name, we are asking for healing to come over her body 100%, Lord. Rid her body of this disease that is trying to ravage her body, Lord. Just flow shit out of her completely 100% and let her be healed for your glory and your glory alone in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.